Well, hello, everyone. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by 101 Hemp, the makers of premium, full-spectrum, raw CBD oil products. Now, because that full-spectrum, raw CBD oil is hemp-derived, that means that it can be shipped worldwide, virtually hassle-free. That also means that you don't have to worry about it making you feel high or intoxicated. So you don't have to worry about failing a drug test. As a matter of fact, you can find their COA, the Certificate of Analysis, on their website. So you can buy and use their products with confidence. So go over to 101hemp.org and order yourself and your pet some raw CBD oil products. And don't forget to use coupon code IMGS25 so you can get 25% off of that order. All right, now let's get started. Brothers and sisters, welcome back. This is the In My Grow Show. I'm your host, Alex, and I want to thank you again for taking the time to hang out. As always, truly do appreciate it. Now, there's a bit of a change in today's show. I know last time I said that I was going to have Canna Queen from Canna Queen Genetics on the show to talk a little bit about, you know, what she does. And we were going to talk about some of the strains, some of the seeds that she sent me. Um, Unfortunately, we are not able to make that happen. We did do the interview, but things just had to be changed around. So um, that's going to be in a later episode, and I'll definitely let you know when that's actually going to happen. So today I'm going to play a conversation that I have with Jay Lederman, who is a criminal defense lawyer. And he's going to talk more about um, expungement and more specifically cannabis charge expungement. But before that, I want to talk about a few things. Uh, The first thing is about the YouTube video episodes. So those episodes typically go up a day after the audio episodes go up. The audio episodes typically go up, you know, Sundays. The videos will go up probably Monday or Tuesday. So if you don't see them right away on Sundays when the audio episode comes out, it's because it takes me about another, an extra day to, you know, edit the video portion together. So that's all. The other thing I want to talk about is um, just some of the hardships right now that are going on in the cannabis industry, mostly with a lot of farmers, especially up here in California. You know, there's with the wildfires in California, in Oregon and Washington, um, you know, a lot of the cannabis industry is really devastated right now. Small time cultivators are just losing their farms or losing their crops. And, you know, it's it's really a hard thing because none of those farmers have crop insurance, can get crop insurance as far as I understand it. Um, if some of them do, it's very few of them. The same thing goes for the hemp industry as well, you know. And on top of that, there was like an early snowstorm that hit Colorado. For like two days, they had freezing temperatures. A lot of people, not just in the cannabis industry, but in the hemp industry got really affected by that early snowstorm out there. So, you know, if you see a cultivator, if you see a cannabis or a hemp farmer, thank them and, I don't know, man, just, you know, our prayers go out to them. Yeah, it's it's a hard thing, and it's a crazy thing right now in California. The fires aren't really near me, but everything has, like, a smoky haze to it. You know, everything has this like sepia tone, like an, it's it's an unreal thing. I haven't seen the sun really like seen the sun in a week. It's been this really crazy haze. You know, early in the morning, the sun looks red through the smoke. It's a crazy thing. Uh, you know, it's funny because I have family out in Texas and they're asking me, why don't you move back to Texas? Because weed isn't legal in Texas. That's why. It may be decriminalized. You know, they're telling me things like, oh, well, you know, they're not really arresting people. No, but they're still putting them in the system. Anyways, I'm not moving back to Texas anytime soon. But, uh, yeah, I don't know what that was about, the tangent on Texas. I just... And another quick note, if you didn't know, there is a smoking game attached to this show. Every time you hear me say, like I said which uh, <laughs> kind of turns into a catchphrase sometimes. Um, every time you hear me say that, like I said, you've got to smoke. And then we'll see how high you are at the end of the show. Well, I mean, you can gauge it. I won't really know. But like I said, do it. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I have, to make, I have to make a joke about that, man, because I, I edit the show and I hear how many times I say it. 
Um, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm trying my best, trying to get around it, trying to get past it, make lo- make light of it. But yeah, toke every time. Or keep count and then send it in. I don't know if I'd read it or really, I don't know. Anyways, let's move forward. So something else I wanted to talk about was that a couple of days ago, my, my daughter's in high school and all classes are online. And I don't know if this has to do anything with, you know, classes being online and everybody, you know, living a majority of their life online. But we got a notice from her school that they're recruiting athletes for esports. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess, you know, they're really taking seriously video game playing. Uh, they're going to be forming teams for Fortnite, Overwatch, and um, some some other game. I don't know. I don't know. I thought it was kind of interesting and a little weird just to have teams that way. Oh, and the notice also said um, to encourage, you know, in order to recruit team players or teammates or players. Anyways, in order to recruit, they were saying that a lot of colleges are actually giving out scholarships now for esports which I thought was even more kind of interesting and weird and a sign of the times. My question is this, and I'm not trying to, you know, be negative or, or dump on anybody, but do we call eSports players athletes? I mean, is it an athletic? I don't know. I mean, what do you think? Is it an athletic? Are they athletes? I mean, well, I mean, because then we got to define what is an athletic event or what, what is, ath- yeah, what's an athlete? I don't know. I don't know. It's just a funny time. Just a funny time. I just wanted to pass that along with you, you know, see what you thought. Let me know what you think. Are they, are they athletes? Do we call them athletes? You know, because it was kind of a weird thing, too. Like when the quarantine first came out, NASCAR was having um, virtual races where, Actual NASCAR drivers were playing video games against each other. It it was it was kind of a weird thing to see. I wasn't ready for it. I didn't think it was to that point, but I guess whatever you know, you do what you can to hang on to your fan base, right? So uh, yeah, it, it was interesting. Hold on, I gotta take a drink of water. I'm running out of spit. So now there is no strain of the week this week, and mostly because I didn't pick up anything new. What I did pick up was um some cherry ak-47 i'm a big fan of the ak-47 ak-47 is one of like my top five and then the cherry ak is just a beautiful pheno type of that i should say the cherry is a beautiful pheno of the ak-47 i mean can you is that a good bud to, let's see let's pick a bigger bud let's see if i can show you a bigger one and I want to encourage you, if you're listening to the podcast, to look for the uh, video episode so you can see some of the buds that I'm showing. Let's see if it focuses. Does it focus there? At any rate, um, the AK-47, man, the cherry AK-47, it's a beautiful, beautiful flower. And this, actually, I picked this up from, who did who put this together? Glasshouse Farms. Again, God, those guys are consistent. And it comes in at a 20% THC. Um, But if you do see the Cherry AK-47, pick it up. If you see the AK-47, pick it up. If you live in California and you see the Glasshouse AK-47, definitely grab it. Totally worth it. But again, didn't have anything new. I just wanted to point out the AK-47 that I truly love it. And um, can I say AK-47 one more time? Cherry AK-47. Okay. Now, let's get to the report from the Cannabis Frontline. And the first article I'm going to read comes out of Leafly. It is entitled, Rolling Papers, Blunt Wraps, May Harbor Heavy Metal Pesticides. And it was put together by Michelle Colbert or Mitchell. You know, I can never remember which one spelled which way, Michelle or Mitchell. I apologize to whoever wrote this if I mispronounced your name. Okay, it starts off, leading California lab, SC Lab, spent two months this summer testing 118 rolling papers, cones, wraps, and cellulose rolling papers purchased from Amazon and several smoke shops around Santa Cruz. 
Nearly 1 in 10 rolling papers, about 13 of them, failed California's stringent standard for legal cannabis product purities, including 8 of 20 types of blunt wraps, SC lab tested, and all 3 cellulose-based rolling papers tested. But in total, most of the products did pass. But it is an interesting thing to look at because, I mean, you know, California is really stringent on testing their cannabis. But, I mean, why don't they apply that same stringent testing to other products that are in the market that we also inhale, like rolling papers? Because rolling papers aren't just used for cannabis. They're also used. People still roll their tobacco products with rolling papers. And it turns out some of them have, like, really high levels of lead. And, you know, um, there are no safe levels of lead. You know, all lead is bad for us. But this also explains why, like, early in 2018, 2019, some pre-rolls were, were failing tests. They, they were being pulled off shelves or not even put on shelves. And that was because of the rolling papers. And a lot of that apparently has to do with, you know, it's just, it, it's just less regulated. And paper itself is, like, heavily sprayed for, for like, pesticides and fungicides. So, yeah, um, I think everything should be tested as stringent as cannabis is. Or at the very least, either that or dial back the stringent testing for cannabis. Just make it all a level, play, a level playing field, you know. Um, because oh, it just seems that it, everybody imagines cannabis can absorb all this cost. That cannabis is, legal cannabis is dripping with money. It's just not the case, man. It is just not the case. All right, now let's dive into the uh, political scene for a little bit. And let's talk about Joe Biden. Now, this article comes out of, I'm going to read a little bit from this article from the Marijuana Moment. It is put together by Kyle Yeager. It's titled, Biden pledges to force people who use drugs to enroll in mandatory treatment programs. That is some bullshit. Starts off, in a recent speech, Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden reaffirmed his position that people convicted of low-level drug offenses should be forced into rehabilitation in order to stay out of jail and get their records cleared. Why don't they just um, reschedule it so it is not illegal and people don't have to be put in a system or into mandatory drug rehab centers because they're caught with pot? Being caught with pot doesn't mean that you have a pot problem. It doesn't mean that you need to go to rehab centers. Being caught with pot just means most of the time that you like smoking pot. What, what, I, I, this guy has some old antiquated ideas about cannabis. You know, he, he's trying to keep people in the system over cannabis instead of just doing the simplest thing. To help a whole lot of people out. To help the economy out. Schedule it so it isn't illegal anymore. It's just that easy. Why are you circling this topic? Why is this old guy circling this topic? Why do they have this old guy even as a... Anyways. Uh, <laughs> I gotta stop myself, man. I was about to... But it goes hand in hand with a lot of things. This kind of thinking that Biden has goes hand in hand with a couple of things that are going on. It's, it's bullshit that they're trying to associate cannabis use with a drug problem, with, with, with you having an issue, okay? Um, I, I'm not voting for this guy. Fuck this guy. This is a stupid... If he's like this for cannabis, what are his other antiquated policies? First of all, I don't know what his antiquated policies are because he hasn't spoken about them. You know what I want from Biden? I want student debt relief. That's what I want. I want student loan debt relief. I want health care for all from Biden. Um, how about a little legal cannabis? What else? Yeah. Uh, anyways, let's move on to the next story, huh? Now, this next story also comes from the Marijuana Moment as well, put together by Kyle Yeager, and it sort of goes hand in hand with what Biden's trying to do. It's entitled, Twitter partners with Fed on campaign flagging marijuana searches while giving alcohol a pass. Starts off, Twitter is partnering with the Federal Drug Agency to promote substance misuse treatment resources when users of social media platforms search for marijuana or certain other substance-related keywords. 
but no such health warnings appear with results for alcohol-connected terms. In collaboration with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, Twitter this week began adding a notification above relevant tweets on select drug terms to say, If you or someone you know is struggling with substance use, you are not alone. It directs users to SAMHSA's helpline and website. So if someone types in marijuana in Twitter, Twitter will put up a little notification to say, hey, you know, you can get help here for for addiction. Again, that's the propaganda of going hand in hand that marijuana, that because you use marijuana, you're addicted. Or even because you search for the word marijuana, you have a problem with addiction. What if you're looking for information? What if you're you could be looking for any number of things. First of all, why don't they call it cannabis? That fucking word marijuana um, gets my blood up. Anyways, you know, it, it's, it's a whole thing of control, man. This is bullshit. They don't do this for alcohol. Why not? Alcohol is a lot more destructive than cannabis. But they want to lump not just, they want to lump cannabis or the word marijuana in with other drugs like cocaine and heroin and, 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 and crystal meth because if you search for any of those, the same kind of warning comes up. Why is marijuana, why is cannabis in there with it? Because it's a fucking form of control for everybody. This is bullshit and this is the kind of stereotype and the kind of fucking mentality that we're all struggling against. And that's why, because you're watching and because you're here, you know what? We're all co-conspirators in this whole cannabis game. You and I, we're co-conspirators. And that's what we are. That's what we're going to start to do. We're going to start to co-conspire to get sure, to make sure that cannabis, you know, that we get the respect it needs. Now, the last article that I'm going to talk about is entitled, Navy Explains Why It Bans Hemp Shampoo and Lotions for Sailors. And again, as all the other articles today, it came out of the marijuana moment. You would think they were sponsors of the show. Hell, I should reach out. huh? Hey, man, sponsor the show. Let's do this together. No, but seriously, again, Kyle Yeager put this together. And a few months ago, the Navy came out and said that they did not want, they were banning CBD products um, for all of their service people. They can't use them. It's, it's banned. They're not supposed to use them. Shampoos, lotions, chewing gum, whatever. You can't use them if you're in the Navy. And the reason they're giving is because they want to make sure that some of the service, that people aren't going to take THC by mistake since the labeling is so, what's the word? It isn't consistent. Consistent. So the Navy's trying to make sure that um, no one's getting high and no one's going to be, you know, charged with a dirty drug test. They're saying that it's all about readiness and preparedness, which is kind of weird because um, CBD products don't make you feel if they're, you know, under 0.3 THC. They shouldn't make you feel high. But I don't know. You know, I think it, it, it's just the federal government not wanting to legitimize cannabis completely, you know, before or I should say it's just the military not want, wanting to legitimize cannabis products or hemp products before the federal government comes out with you know their regulations and their ability to tax it basically i don't know man it just is it's just weird um if you're in the navy no cbd for you guys definitely no thc so um you're gonna have to get that pain relief somewhere else you're gonna have to get that 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 shine in your hair that you used to get from cbd shampoo you're gonna have to get it somewhere else so no lotion either no no cbd topicals for for inflammation you're gonna have to take drugs so sorry navy um can't do it can't do it and that brothers and sisters is the report from the cannabis front line it's and blah 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 as always there are links in the show notes so you can look at these articles read them at your leisure and uh let me know what you think Okay, now, next, I'm going to play a conversation that I have with Jay Lederman, who is a criminal defense lawyer here in Ventura County, and he is also a member of Normal, and I invited him on the show because I wanted to continue to talk about, because I think it's important, about how to help people get cannabis convictions expunged from the record, and also to really help explain what expungement means in California. 
because if you're not aware, if you're in California and you have a cannabis offense on your record, nonviolent, you cannot participate in the legal cannabis market. Okay, so if you do have one of those nonviolent cannabis offenses, you can get it expunged and then you can actually get a job in the cannabis market in some way, either as a bud tender or even start your own business if you're lucky enough. Because there's a whole other set of things there too about being lucky enough to open your own cannabis business here in California, but we're going to talk about that some uh, next week probably with Rodney. But anyways, getting back to Jay Lederman. Yeah, he, 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 you know, really was awesome enough to give me some of his time because the guy's really busy. So hang tight for me real quick. I'm going to play a little bit of music and then I'm going to put that conversation on for you. Well, everyone, today with me on the show, I have Jay Lederman, who is a criminal defense attorney and a member of Normal, which is the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. And I invited him to come on the show just to help us understand what cannabis charge expungement really is. Jay, brother, welcome to the show, man. Thank you very much for taking the time. Oh, thanks for having me. So... So, Jay, real quick, help me um, understand, you know, a lot of us are really confused about what expungement is. You know, a lot of us think that it means that it is something that is stricken from your record, never to be seen again by anybody. <laughs> that's, you know, that that's, would be the idyllic expungement. Um, it's uh, in California, there's not a true expungement. It's... um. It's uh, relief under 1203.4 of the penal code. <clears throat> and what it does is it removes it from your record for certain purposes. And it, and it is really helpful. I mean, it, it removes it, for example, for um, like your background check. If you're getting a job, like a, a regular job, it won't show up there. So, I mean, that's a good thing. If you're getting a job with like, well, for example, a uh, lawyer. Um, it shows up for us, uh, lawyers, doctors, nurses, um, because they have access to like medicine, um, bankers, you know, because they, um, you know, they want to know if there's theft convictions in the past, uh, cops, um, you, you know, you, not too many, um, not too many professions, but it comes up for certain professions. Interestingly enough, right now, when you apply for a cannabis license, um, or even a work at a cannabis, um, like a, a cannabis shop, you have to disclose uh, things that have been um, for which you've received 1203.4 relief, which I'll, I'll hesitate to call a uh, an expungement. Um, so it's there. Um, it's there for prior ability. If it's, for example, if you've had um, a strike expunged, which you you can have. Um, it's, it's still there on your record. If you community of crime, there's, you know, it's there. Um, and, or a DUI, for example, um, would be there within, you know, within 10 years to enhance your DUI from a first time to a second time. Um, and it doesn't restore your firearm rights. But other than that, I mean, it's, it's a good thing. It's just not a perfect thing. Um, however, um, there was a change to <clears throat> the, pardon me, there was a change to the relief you can receive um, with the uh, enactment of Prop 64, which was the, um, the proposition that uh, allowed recreational cannabis for adults. And what that did was it went back and changed certain marijuana crimes to from felonies to misdemeanors and allowed for a true expungement, those wouldn't or hypothetically shouldn't come up on a background check except for the enumerated professions. And they do restore firearm rights and all of your civil liberties that were, that were lost 
and cannabis crimes aren't priorable. Um, so it's, it's a much better thing than 1203.4 relief. And it's much closer to a true expungement. So now you said if, <clears throat> if someone does have, let's say a nonviolent cannabis crime on their record, they can get that expunged. Um, but it's still going to come up if they want to work in the cannabis industry. Right. Um, right. And I, I believe, um, and I'm, I'm shooting from the hip here because it's been a while since I've dealt with it, but I believe it's not a per se disqualifier under the, um, under the law that you can't have a drug conviction and work in the cannabis industry. Um, but it does have to be disclosed. So it's at the discretion of the um, chief of police in the jurisdiction where you're uh, the chief of police or the sheriff in the jurisdiction where you're applying for your cannabis, um, I guess, permits or, or, you know, permission to work on site or, or what have you. So, you know, at what point, when is someone, when they have a nonviolent cannabis conviction, when are they eligible to actually, I don't do, do we petition the DA for an expungement or how does that work in California? You petition the court. There are several different, they make it um, uh, fairly easy on you. There are several different um, forms that they publish online. And I believe Ventura has its own form for a um, for a cannabis related uh, reduction and dismissal. And you just fill it out with your, you know, your case number, your, you know, your charges and and all of that. And then there's uh, there's a form in there. You have to serve the D.A. and there's a form in there for the D.A. to respond, whether they um, disagree. I mean, it's. It's not that they can just oppose it because it's the law, but whether they disagree as to whether you're eligible for the relief, which would only be in really a few circumstances. So um, you just file the, the form with the court and the court will, um, will rule on it. A lot of times it'll rule on it um, what's called ex party. So they'll just... Um, you know, the DA either will or won't submit a response and the court will just look at it in chambers and sign off on it and mail it back to you. Okay. So now would I have to be like a, a certain time without any charges, like a year without any charges before I can apply? And do I have to also make sure all my like court fees are paid off? Well, for an expungement, yes. Um, for Prop 64, I mean, since that went into effect in 2018, you're going to be, you know, at least two years without um, without any charges or oh wow, two anything years like that. Well, I mean, you're just going to be because it went into effect. Oh, oh, um, I see. You know, it went into effect in 2018, so it's that's just um, that's just a matter of due course. So here's how um, here's how it works with um, cannabis charges. Now you can apply for 1203.4 relief. If you've gotten probation, you can apply at the end of the term of probation for a, um, you know, for the, the relief. And, um, if you don't get probation, because, you know, for a lot of these, uh, things they're giving the minimum, which is a $500 fine, at least here in Ventura, they are. Um, or at least were, I, they really haven't been filing these, uh, it, which is, I mean, my gosh, how times have changed. Um, but they really aren't filing cannabis cases anymore. And, uh, if you, d so if you get the $500 fine, yes. Uh, in fact, you do have to wait a year and you do have to pay off all your fines and fees before you can get it expunged or before you can get the 1203.4 relief. But post 2018, it'll be, you won't be applying for the plot prop 64 relief. So if it's something, you know, that you picked up after 2018, then, you know, you, you'd be just applying for a regular old 1203.4. A quick question. Can you just talk a little bit about, because sometimes they go hand in hand, how a weapons charge along with that cannabis charge can really complicate someone's situation. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, Weapons, I mean, 
drugs and and um, and guns don't don't mix. And that's you know that's when you're gonna find a charge um, leveled against you on cannabis, and it's primarily going to be a gun charge. And and often in those cases, it's not surprising if the case resolves solely for the gun charge and the cannabis charge gets dismissed. Um, and it, it's the gun charge is often a felony and um, it's just, it, it's something that they don't like to see. So um, it doesn't, a gun doesn't elevate a cannabis charge to a felony um, if it's not already a felony and it doesn't qualify for, you know, the, the gun and drug, um, there, there's a gun and drug charge, for example, if you have heroin or meth with a gun, there's a specific charge that, that, um, you can, that you, that can be levied at you that, um, you, you know, is gun and drug essentially together. Plus you can get charged individually with the gun and individually with the, with the drugs you can't get double punished on it, but I mean, you can get convicted of, of all three. So that's a mess. And cannabis isn't listed among the drugs that you can be charged with that for. However, um, it's not something that the, um, that the cops and that the DAs like to see. Yeah, I bet. (laughs) I bet. I mean, uh, I, I think it does seem easier to get that, um, cannabis charge dismissed than an illegal weapons charge because I, I assume that's a federal offense by then no I, I mean it, it can be um, and it could be a fact a very serious federal offense but I mean they don't the feds don't bother with a, a simple you know cannabis with with guns and a, and a lot of people you know do have you know do have firearms um, and and cannabis and you know it's they're they're both i mean cannabis is lawful and you know if if you've otherwise kept your gun you know well and you know by and by law i mean it's a second amendment right um and while cops aren't crazy to see it if your gun is stored away and and out of the reach of children or you know in a in a gun safe or something like that um there's nothing to charge you on with respect to the gun with having it with cannabis. So it's unlawful firearm activity. It's, um, you know, it's these like ARs with the extended cartridges or, you know, silencers or, you know, a felon in possession or, um, you know, some type of modified gun. People are really into modifying their, their guns these days. And, um, you know, we're seeing, I'm seeing personally a lot of those cases, a lot of felon in possessions and a lot of drug cases. So when they come and they find, you know, cannabis, even if it's your, you know, six plants, um, you know, six mature plants, you know, out back and, um, you know, they see a gum with it and you're a, a previous felon, you know, that that's when you're going to see the, the charges. Hey, Jay, so I kind of want you to tell the future here a little bit for me. I just want to get your opinion on it. So, you know, it's an election year and everyone's really talking up, you know, legalization or decriminalization of cannabis. And, you know, they're talking about certain acts passing the Moore Act with one of them. Um, And we all believe that if cannabis is legalized federally, that instantaneously, you know, all of these people with nonviolent cannabis convictions are going to be set free around America. Is that really the reality? Is that really how it's going to happen? It is how, how it happens. Um, it's called the rule of lenity. And if, um, if, uh, it's, if it's legalized or if it's decriminalized or if it's even taken from schedule one to schedule three, there's an argument that, um, well, schedule one to schedule three, there's an argument. Uh, I mean, legalization, they literally open the prison doors and everyone gets out, like, you know, within, within days, hopefully. Sometimes they drag their feet, but it should be within days that people are released. 
Oh, wow. Wow. Well, that's that's great. Yeah, I always assumed it'd just take some kind of, I don't know, like you said, feet dragon maybe. Well, you know, they don't, they, <laughs> they're never so quick to release prisoners, although they've been fairly good about it in the in this new COVID era, um, you know, because they don't want the guards to get sick. But, um, you know, with things like that, they do tend to drag their feet a little bit. Hey, Jay, let me uh, change directions here a little bit for you, with you. Um, And I'm wondering, have you ever heard of anyone being, like, prosecuted or jammed up for selling seeds, like cannabis seeds, since it is mentioned in the uh, Controlled Substance Act of 1970? I'm just curious. Um, There have been, uh, in fact, very notable prosecutions for distributions of of seeds. There was that um, guy from Vancouver who called himself the Prince of Cannabis, who was shipping seeds from Canada into the U.S. and got like five years here. Um, and I think he got some sort of medical dispensation or or um, commutation or something, something like that. I don't, I, I, or maybe released early on house arrest or some or something. But um, there are. They, I mean, that's that's you know a, a notable case of seeds um on the federal level there are you know on on the state level there are rarely um seeds or there were rarely seed prosecutions i mean now it's it's lawful on the state level but you will still see it on the federal level yeah i was all, I've, I've been real curious about that lately because as some states you know well just a lot of states move towards legalization it's still federally illegal to ship them across state lines or even to use any kind of like the, the postal service or UPS or right. anything like that. So even within the state, if you're using the mail, um, which, you know, seeds, you know, seed distributors tend to use the mail going to, you know, you're going to um, be open to a federal prosecution or you're opening yourself up to a federal prosecution. So even, um, it's just by use of the mails. It doesn't necessarily have to be interstate. Oh, I got you. Since it is like a federal organization and it's still federally illegal. Uh, yeah, it's any you. use of the, the mails, the, the wires, as they say, like a telephone. They all impact interstate commerce. So it doesn't have to be um, it doesn't have to be interstate. Although as a as a matter of of. Um, you know, just as a matter of reality, it typically is. Right. I got you. I got you. Hey, Jay, um, I want to thank you once again for getting on the phone with me. I really do appreciate that. Um, the The topic of expungement, you know, like I was saying earlier, there's a lot of confusion around it. Uh, it's been thrown out, especially lately, about what it is and what people expect it to be. So, again, thank you very much for helping clarify that, man. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, can you do me a favor? Can you let people know where they can find you or if they need any kind of you know, legal defense help, how they can get a hold of you? Sure. I'm in Ventura. Um, my name is Jay Lederman, L-E-I-D-E-R-M-A-N. Um, and you can check me out on the web at um, jlederman.com. And my number is 805-654-0200. And I'm always happy to talk. Right on, right on. Uh, Jay, do me a favor. Don't hang up. Everybody else, I'm going to play a little bit of music and then I'm going to be right back. Well, mis amigos, my friends, look, I want to encourage you if you do have a cannabis conviction on your record i really do want to encourage you to do what you can to get it expunged to to take those steps to look into what it's going to take to do it um and the easiest place i found to start to look for a lawyer that specializes in this is i looked up the normal chapter for my state or even my county i'm almost sure every state has a chapter not completely but you know look for the closest one and then see if you can get in touch with that lawyer and see if and, and see if they can tell you or at least put you in the right direction of what you need to do to get it expunged. Another thing I did was I actually called up the local DA in my county and asked him what people have to do in the county to get 
charges expunged, not just specifically cannabis, but just charges in general. And that hopefully, you know, will help you do that because, you know, a, a, a cannabis charge or any kind of charge on your record will keep you from certain job opportunities and it'll also keep you out of being able to get higher education, to get into college, even some, you know, uh, city colleges or community colleges. So I, I really want to encourage you to to do what you can to, to get that record cleaned up, to get that whatever you have on your record, to get that conviction expunged. Again, I want to thank Jay Lederman for taking the time to come on the show and, and really helping us understand how to, how to help ourselves. And as always, if you have a question or a comment about this episode, you can send me an email that is inmygrow at gmail.com. Well, hermanos y hermanas, brothers and sisters, that's all I have to share with you today. As always, if you're a cannabis company, the most inexpensive and cost-effective way to reach out to your fans to let the general public know what services and what products you've got coming out is to advertise on the In My Grow Show. If you send me an email, inmygrow at gmail.com, we can absolutely find the best way to do that for you so you can let the audience know what you're up to. Now, for the rest of you, don't forget to leave a rating and a review wherever you listen to the podcast, and then subscribe to the podcast. Then go over to inmygrow.com, subscribe to the website. Then go over to YouTube slash inmygrowshow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Then after you do all that subscribing, do me a favor, tell three other people about the show. Three other people. That's it. Real simple, real easy. So now this week, as citizens of the universe, do me a favor and make sure you get down in 3D. Remember, I love you all very much. And always grow, learn, and teach.